All right, thank you everyone for being here today. We're gonna get started. Thank you, Mr. Cordova Pacas for being here on behalf of ITE Student Chapter and Fair Mobility Research Institute. I'd like to thank you for not only presenting to us, but for everyone that's attending today's webinar. I'm gonna pass it on to Itilio for Mr. Cordova's uh, bio. Okay, hello everyone. So uh, as Jasmine said, thank you, Mr. Cordova for presenting for us. And I'm just gonna give uh, his you know, bio information to everyone. So uh, Professor Tirso Cordova Facas has over 27, 27 years of international experience and a lifetime passion for the logistics and supply chain system. He has a business BA from Universidad Francisco Marroquin in Guatemala and a two-year common area in industrial engineering plus strategy and innovation executive studies at MIT in Boston. He's currently planning a PhD research project in the logistics efficiencies field. Um, he is an affiliated faculty at the Center for Transport Innovation, Education and Research, CTIR at the University of Memphis. Among a combination of multi-industry private business consulting and public, private, international and national institutional experience, ICAO and IMO, for the last 20 years, he has been dedicated to logistics, efficiencies, and infrastructure consulting at a personal and institutional level. For the last 12 years, he has been the chief academic lead on management seminar and supply chain at Universidad Francisco Marroquin in Guatemala. His most recent academic and research milestones include the founding of the undergrad minor in international supply chain management at his university, and he is also the lead professor in international transport logistics and competitiveness and co-founded the Transport Infrastructure Logistics and Supply Chain Research Division at the National Economics uh, Research Center in Guatemala. Uh, Mr. Cordova, the floor is yours for your presentation. Thank you very much, Atilio. Thank you very much. Uh... Dr. Kaiser and Jasmine, uh, I'm honored with the invitation uh, for, the <clears throat> for the presentation. Uh, let's start then. Um, I try to to focus the presentation regarding efficiencies and resilience uh, for competitiveness in, in, in the supply chain and the intermodal freight system um, focused uh, with some examples from the Mid-South and the Southeast part of the USA, uh, and a couple of examples from my country, Guatemala, regarding um, efficiencies uh, uh, related to the resilience due to um, my country's uh, deficiencies in infrastructure and logistics infrastructure. So uh, to begin with uh, about uh, talking about the concept of intermodal freight, I have uh, I want I want to specify about intermodal freight being the transportation. Oh, yeah. uh, the transportation of products and raw material materials in the in a specific mode of uh, a, a device uh, uh, that is the the, the container. Um, infrastructures have to adapt to this uh, type of. Uh, uh, containerization and uh, and the different modes of uh, freight. The three modes uh, uh, of transportation that can transport containers are mainly uh, by rail, uh, truck and uh, inland in and, and ships and maritime ships or uh, even inland waterways. But uh, I want to focus on the importance of and, and the opportunities regarding transloading 
um, those cargoes into uh, containers for air cargo. So the four modes of uh, transportation can be adapted to the different needs uh, regarding uh, the efficiencies that uh, each industry needs. Going a little bit uh, into the concept of resilience, we have that uh, both in the engineering side and psychological uh, side of uh, the study of the concept, we talked about uh, the flexibility that a person or that a system has in order to function correctly regarding some uh, unexpected or even expected events and how they can adjust uh, their performance to those conditions. In logistics specifically, uh, <clears throat> more recently, we, we, we have been exposed, the world has been exposed to, um, to different uh, disruptions, beginning with the COVID pandemic, the actual uh, wars, the political instability, the commercial trade war, uh, they can, uh, the, the Suez Canal uh, disruption uh, in 2021, uh, that opened the eyes of the world regarding uh, how logistics can be resilient and efficient uh, to face those uh, disruptions. We, we, we need to know what has happened uh, when there is a disruption, how to respond, know how, what to do to respond better to that disruption, knowing what to look for, monitor the conditions that's critical in the system. And then uh, we have to anticipate what is going to happen or what could happen again regarding the same situation or even new disruptions in the in the market. Uh, here we, we see that we have to respond to regular and irregular conditions in an effective and flexible manner. And I have added that we should be efficient in the way we uh, respond to those disruptions. And that, that takes us to, to how we prepare if we know what's going to happen. If we don't know what's going to happen, that preparation stage goes left in the graphic until the event occurs. And now we, we, we can see the, the efficiency and resilient uh, way of uh, adapting our operations or our uh, actions against uh, the, the disruption. There are trade-offs regarding uh, how efficient we can be uh, in the resilience application of our uh, effort to respond to the disruption. But how uh, re redundancies can be a way of responding to disruptions, but how efficient is to have redundancies that are uh, too too much of uh, of an effort in order that we can convert that resilience uh, in 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 an inefficient way and and, and be too costly. So uh, this uh, varies uh, regarding 
the different industries uh, in which we are op operating. Uh, um, lo logistically, uh, uh, we we have to we have to come uh, to an optimal optimal outcome. Uh, uh, the the center of this uh, I love this graphic because the center of this uh, uh, is the the. The sweet spot, the sweet spot. We have seen the, this kind of graphics in other other applications, and 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 when you when you get the chance to to search for the presentation in the different media that uh, you will show it, uh, you can pay attention to the to the to the arrows how 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 the flow of connections of the different aspects of um, here we are adding the, the the sustainability aspect of the uh, resilient uh, response to to the <clears throat> I'm sorry to the crisis <clears throat> we can talk about uh, how the resilience and efficiency dichotomy applies to the near shoring or the reshoring effect uh, in the in, in the market. Uh, talking about the the, um, the United States, uh, we are talking about uh, how 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 much the country needs to bring to their own shore the the uh, a lot of manufacturing efforts in order to remain competitive against uh, the the distance and the and the labor cost in china uh, to to prevent to expose to those risks of disruptions regarding uh, uh, the the distance and the culture, cultural effects and even the 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 trade war or the physical uh, um political instability. Now I wanted to, to go to these uh, specific examples uh, regarding intermodal efficiencies uh, and, and, and the resilience and the opportunities that we could see uh, regarding I'm going to talk about uh, specifics in the Florida, Florida case, comparing to some of the opportunities that uh, the state of Georgia next uh, next to Florida is um, is taking advantage from, uh, and all the opportunities that uh, the the Mid East and the Mid South uh, is uh, presenting for this uh, uh, phenomena of uh, uh, of the near shoring and reshoring and the investment is investment opportunities and uh, also the research opportunities for us that like and love to to do feasibility studies and uh, and to search for new opportunities and ventures uh, in, in this field i wanted to talk about uh, how 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 are we planning to connect and to search for data? And uh, 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 what's happening in the East uh, Atlantic shore of the continental USA? Um, we have the Port of Miami, the Air, the Miami Air International Airport. Uh, uh, excuse me, and. Um, Miami International Airport is ranked number 14 in the world regarding uh, passengers <clears throat> and is uh, number 13 ranked number 13 uh, in uh, uh, within the US US regarding air cargo movement 500 miles up north, we have uh, Atlanta Hartsfield Jackson Airport uh, that is number one in the world regarding uh, physical passengers, and it's number 17 within the US regarding air cargo. So there's a, a little bit of comparison there. 
about the opportunities that we can get from the ports, the maritime ports that uh, are uh, functioning in Florida's and Georgia's uh, uh, shores and, and trying to compare and to find solutions and efficiencies regarding connecting uh, cargos uh, through rail or, or transloading cargos into air cargo, uh, having these uh, assets and capabilities in the uh, international airports of these cities. I wanted to comment also that uh, Memphis uh, has uh, kind of uh, a small passenger airport within the US rankings, but it's uh, ranked number one or number two in the world regarding world ca air cargo because uh, of the FedEx uh, global headquarters and, and distribution centers in, in based in Memphis. So we can see how the volume of cargoes within an industry or within a region can impact uh, the operation the operations of these uh, logistic infrastructures. In the same cities, the, the port of Miami is a small port regarding uh, the US and, and, and the world, uh, moving 1.2 million TEUs uh, annually uh, as of uh, last year's uh, statistics. But we have uh, 400 miles up north, uh, the port of Savannah in Georgia, uh, moving almost 6 million TEUs and projecting more than 10 million TEUs in the next decade uh, regarding the, the, the investments in new infrastructure that they are applying to, to their business uh, model. <clears throat> In order to compare how the top 10 uh, ports, uh, cargo container cargo ports in the world uh, are, are behaving, we have uh, Shanghai with 47 million and Rotterdam in 10th place with 15 million. So the port of Savannah is trying to get there in the top five of the world uh, in the next decade. Looking for some more statistics, uh, we, we can see how, how we can compare the potential uh, and actual investments in bridging uh, new, new crane technology and sizes, uh, dredging to get uh, uh, bigger ships, attend the uh, bigger ships uh, in, in, in Savannah port how this attracts a new business uh, for the medium and long term. We see, uh, I highlighted here the three uh, ports near the near your area in FAU, uh, Port of Miami, Port Everglades and Jacksonville are more or less the same kind of, uh, of volume uh, annually. Uh, but together they are moving around uh, three and a half million TEUs and they can connect with uh, <clears throat> these intermodal efficiencies to the to all the mid-south uh, that has great potential for uh, manufacturing investment we will see that in a moment so we can talk about some research opportunities we have uh, regarding uh, the finding of uh, new data. It's, it's a little bit complicated in, in this industry to find to find good data from from port and airport operators. But we can we can search for uh, for data so that we can see what uh, possibilities and what business opportunities are in transloading and cross-docking cargo uh, uh, within the air cargo mode to the maritime and rail cargo modes.
Here we can see six intermodal facilities that have been built in the last years yeah, around all these uh, uh, great economic uh, uh, area of the mid-south mid and mid-east of the country. And we can see, uh, we, we will see later how, how we can connect from the port of Miami to Jacksonville and going all the way to Memphis and connecting there to Chicago and, and the Northeast that are the most uh, uh, economic, uh, positive economic areas uh, in the country. These, these six uh, intermodal facilities uh, were built so that uh, the congestion of cargo in the ports can be uh, get into uh, physical facilities, but uh, now they are converting them into intermodal facilities so that the rail, the train can get uh, this cargo out of the congested uh, uh, urban areas uh, uh, surrounding the Savannah, the port of Savannah, and connecting them to the manufacturing facilities in all these uh, four states together. I highlighted the 500,000 TEUs a year uh, of, uh, of capacity of these uh, six intermodal yards because. Uh, that's exactly the um, the um, the amount of uh, uh, cargo that uh, in my country Guatemala the, the the main port in the Pacific Ocean uh, moves in a year. So with six small intermodal yards uh, in between uh, three states here in the U.S., uh, they move from one maritime port to inland ports the same cargo that my country moves in a year. Uh, and that uh, port in the Pacific, Puerto Quetzal, uh, is the, the most important port between uh, Lázaro Cárdenas uh, port in Mexico and Balboa port in Panama. So uh, it's kind of uh, in an important regional port in the Pacific. <clears throat> this, uh, um, this facility that's in the northern part of Georgia, that it's moving uh, some uh, important uh, uh, amount of uh, cargo. Um, I wanted to show you how, how those efficiencies impact uh, this, uh, the, the, the sustainability, the environmental sustainability for, for these uh, companies using this mix of transport between uh, maritime ports and inland ports, uh, using uh, the train instead of trucks to get out of the congested areas. Um, and, and using the factors uh, the, uh, in the environmental, uh, the, the, the emissions factor of each mode of transport, uh, truck or either train, uh, we get that in a year, the savings, the total savings are <clears throat> over the 100,000 uh, metric tons. Uh, uh, of carbon less in in a year. That's uh, the same as taking out of our roads the the, the polluting impact of sixteen thousand cars. Just in just using a train uh, in in a route almost uh, four hundred miles away from uh, uh, going from the port of Savannah to to this intermodal facility. Uh, just one facility, so it's a, it's a real uh, positive impact for the environment. Here we can see uh, how 
in this highlighted area, uh, we, we have a lot of manufacturing facilities that need, that need uh, these resiliencies and efficiencies uh, in the supply chain system uh, to work better and to reinforce the, the capabilities of the US to, to bring uh, back uh, to the region or uh, uh, onshore their own uh, country, uh, the manufacturing that uh, is happening offshore and very uh, uh, in a very long distance uh, regarding Asian countries. Uh, even though we are talking about uh, those efficiencies and using rail to get out of the congested uh, port areas, we can see this uh, the, this graphic of this projection uh, in that in the next 10 years uh, the the truck traffic uh, the uh, freight regarding is is going to explode is going to exponentially grow uh, uh, and uh, that should not happen uh, we we should be more efficient than this uh, as you can see the flow and the weight of the of the heavier truck traffic is is towards the the eastern mid and and northeastern part of the of the country here in florida we, we have uh, kind of in the middle of the uh, of the rankings um very heavy in the in the Los Angeles uh, area connecting with Texas uh, because there is uh, uh, the, the all the imports from from China going in into Los Angeles and Long Beach uh, we can see it here uh, how it's projected to 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 grow here, there's an example. This is uh, information uh, back to 2005 from the Department of Transportation. I didn't find any new uh, um, data uh, regarding this, but this is a great example going from the port of Galveston in the south of Texas, getting out of the urban areas here, we see that the average speed of uh, truck cargo is, uh, is is very slow. So what I'm proposing here in my country in Guatemala and 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 with these examples in in the Georgia side of the port of Savannah and uh, their connections with uh, manufacturing facilities outside the the port region, but inside the state, what we should do is to get out but by train and to connect to these facilities outside the urban areas. And then we can connect this cargo going to the main cities or to the main markets uh, by truck and then transloading to, to the mode of transport that they need if, either if they are going to use that cargo inside the country or export that cargo outside the country. Here I'm highlighting the <clears throat> these opportunities. This map shows the, the the data from 2016, and there's no new data regarding this, but uh, they are saying they are supposed to be more or less the same uh, volume of cargo. Uh, we can compare this to to the la last graphic uh, showing truck cargo. We can see here how the, the the train cargo volumes are 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 doing in the country. We again see uh, very heavy volumes going going from the imports from Asia to Long Beach and, and Los Angeles ports, going to Chicago and the northeast part of the country. We we see a little bit uh, of heavier vol heavy volume too from uh, the West Coast to, to Texas. We see very light volumes here in the Eastern part of Florida where you are located. 
connecting with uh, little, little heavier volumes here in Birmingham, Alabama. Here's Memphis with the uh, lighter volumes. But I see those, all that as great opportunities because there is cargo going in and out of, of, these, uh, of these ports in the eastern part of the country. But something's happening that uh, we are not connecting those cargos or using those cargos or promoting business with those cargos as it happens in the West Coast connecting to the, to the Northeast uh, region of the country. So I think uh, Port of Miami and Jacksonville can connect with the Savannah, Memphis to 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 pro, to supply all this area with uh, with business with uh, valuable cargo, either by truck, by train, by by, by airplane, uh, and and getting out or in from uh, the the imports. Uh, via maritime cargo and uh, exporting via maritime or, or either air cargo too. Here we can see the, the actual uh, rail, railway connections. Again, we see a heavier movement and a heavier volume of investment in this uh, kind of in infrastructures from the middle and northeastern part of the country again. Again, we, 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 we see Florida here only with one provider that is uh, the Florida East Coast Railway that is connecting with uh, Jacksonville. And then we, ha we have a couple of other lines connecting with Savannah. Memphis here has five uh, class one rail connections, the same as St. Louis and Chicago. But as we, as we, we saw in the, in the, in the volume, uh, rail, rail volume of cargo, uh, the, the cargos are heavier, but for some reason, uh, Chicago, St. Louis, and Memphis have five class uh, 1A, one uh, rail services. Those are the only three cities in the U.S. that have five class 1A rail services for cargo. Here we see the connections um, reinforcing the, the importance of the near shoring with Mexico. Mexico has just surpassed uh, China as the first uh, uh, commercial partner for the U.S. So, so these uh, production sites in Mexico have heavy connections, as we will see in the next uh, map. Uh, heavy connections and investments going in, going on uh, regarding uh, a new inland uh, uh, dry channel here in uh, uh, from Salina Cruz to Coatzacoalcos uh, is El Istmo de Tehuantepec it's named it's a kind of uh, double the, uh, the distance uh, of the Panama Canal but uh, but it's dry it doesn't uh, uh, need a it doesn't have the problems that the uh, Panama Canal is having right now with the water levels. So, uh, and it depends, it depends on the geopolitical uh, uh, internal Mexico side uh, uh, of the, of the subject, but uh, that's not our case here. But uh, this, the, this is heavily used, uh, e even connecting with, uh, barges or, or smaller ships to connect cargos, agricultural uh, commodities cargos from here, from Mexico to mobile uh, Alabama and the port of New Orleans. So intermodality in reality works and, and it needs uh, uh, research, it needs uh, uh, feasibility studies and it needs uh, heavy funding 
uh, to reinforce and to protect the security and safety of uh, of the supply chain uh, in the in the country and uh, their neighboring countries. This is uh, uh, recent uh, in, uh, data re regarding uh, a ranking uh, of the man best manufacturing, uh, best states for manufacturing business. We see Florida, uh, the, the number one that we will see in a chart is uh, South Carolina. But, but this region has so many opportunities that uh, what I'm saying that the intermodal connections regarding uh, rail and, and truck connections uh, have to be uh, the most efficient here to 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 take advantage of that uh, uh, opportunities. Here is a little bit of uh, the information uh, of the data that is uh, used for the rankings. The geographic position, I think it's uh, too low in the related weight of the ranking, because I think uh, geographic position of, uh, of a physical place is very important for the competitive NEF side. And here we can see how Tennessee, Georgia, and Florida are near the top 10 of the rankings. Um, Florida has a uh, hundred percent of ranking of qualification in the geographic position, but I think it could be better positioned because it has a great geographic position and great access to to the maritime side of the business. Here we can see the, the two main <clears throat> regions, the producing and manufacturing regions from, from Mexico, Monterrey, and Silao, and how the, these companies are connecting with, te <clears throat> with Texas and using all the other lines connecting to Memphis, Atlanta, Miami, and all the ports in this side. Are we, um, and also with uh, South Carolina and North Carolina. So investments are, 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 are being made because there are opportunities. Here we can see a little bit more of uh, all the highways and uh, uh, pipelines and infrastructure that Mexico is building around the Istmo de Tehuantepec, the, the, the dry canal that I was showing in the in, in the previous uh, graphic. How it connects to Central America. There is actual uh, uh, cargo going by truck, as we will see in the example uh, of the banana industry from Guatemala uh, in a little bit. Here we can see the, the, the distances is more or less to two and a half times uh, the, the distance of the Panama Canal here, but by, by land, either, either by truck, pipelines, or, or railway. Euro, Europe <clears throat> is already pushing for, for uh, in, in the next decade to reduce drastically the, the, the amount of uh, uh, cargo uh, being transported by truck. They are, they are uh, letting trucks only for, for the first part or the last part of the supply chains. But uh, the, the major distances, the larger distances they are using and proposing uh, legally proposing and forcing the industries to be more sustainable and, and, and to use a mass, mass cargo uh, infrastructure like ports and, 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 uh, and railway for, uh, for, for freight. <clears throat> the, 
the world has been working to to build more efficient commercial routes. I think we have uh, we have heard about the, the the Belt and Road Initiative that China is proposing uh, to to more efficient and more sustainable uh, ways uh, of trade. Here we see all the train connections going from China to Europe. And here the, the routes that they are proposing and reinvesting in ports, uh, connecting uh, the same with the Europe. Now, there are a lot of political issues that is not our subject here, but uh, those political issues have uh, have uh, put this uh, giant uh, project into the doubt part of the uh, of the feasibility because of all the political instability in the regions. Uh, we we can see here how the same the same is connecting these important ports in Asia uh, and trying to connect to 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 the markets the more the the, the heavier. Uh, economic value markets in, in, in Europe. And uh, uh, landing in the couple of examples of resiliency that I wanted to show from my country, even though we are fighting against corruption and deficiencies in, um, in logistics infrastructure, uh, we have managed to have uh, a couple of uh, agricultural commodities industries uh, and we lead the world in this but how <clears throat> uh, in the banana industry we have the, the the largest independent producer in the world the country has uh, 85,000 acres uh, planted a banana uh, planted in banana and the soil is very productive. Uh, we we have uh, two and a half times more productivity in the field uh, than Ecuador, that is the second largest producer in the world. So, uh, we uh, with that uh, productivity in the fields, uh, we we can compete uh, even though we have uh, one of the worst. Uh, rankings in, in uh, logistics infrastructure in the world. We have so bad infrastructure that uh, uh, our roads and highways are the worst in the in the world. Uh, we have uh, a logistic uh, average speed of uh, 10, 11, 12 miles an hour. And, and we can see here that uh, a banana producer next to the border with Mexico prefers to ship uh, uh, by truck to their distributors in McAllen, Texas, 1,300 miles, uh, but but uh, they, they, they can do between 50 and 60 miles an hour of average speed uh, with two days maximum uh, of processes, custom processes uh, at the border. With only 390 miles within the same country, uh, shipping uh, those banana containers from the Atlantic port to to supply uh, the the eastern market of the USA, uh, uh, we do almost double the time that that the other container uh, traveling through Mexico is doing, and the double time in, in port and and, and custom processes. So this is very bad uh, qualifications regarding uh, efficiencies in infrastructure uh, and, the, and the supply chain side, but they have managed to, 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 to comply with the, the quality and times with their customers in the US. Guatemala is the number one supplier for the US in banana, so uh, for sure that the bananas you are eating in the US are, are come from these uh, farms in Guatemala. And here I wanted to uh, uh, highlight uh, 
uh, a railway uh, connection uh, to so, uh, to the banana market uh, suppliers uh, in in India, so they can uh, provide supply the Middle Eastern countries. So uh, th this is uh, another example of uh, intermodality efficiency and resilience. The industry in Guatemala have high qualifications uh, re uh, regarding the, the, the international industry. And uh, they are they are marketing uh, and selling through the big uh, three big brands, Dole, Chiquita, and, and they are uh, trying to 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 use their own brands to open markets in Europe. Now, uh, to end with the presentation, um, I, I'm presenting the, the the example of the sugar the the sugar cane in industry with all those uh, deficiencies in infrastructure. I have told you, uh, Guatemala is the fifth largest export uh, sugar exported in the world. Um, this this uh, information uh, doesn't take into account the largest uh, export in the world that uh, it's India, but after India is Brazil and then Thailand, Australia, and Guatemala. They also have byproducts and they lead the market in byproducts. <clears throat> they use the Houston and New, uh, New Orleans ports uh, to supply uh, molasses and syrups for animal foods. Uh, and they also do alcohols and biofuels uh, for other industries. And they do this in a facility um, inside a little port town in the Pacific. So th th this is the actual facility for molasses and byproducts. And this is a small little town. So the safety and security of the supply chain here is very risky, but they they, they comply. They comply with the, the international standards, even though these uh, these large deficiencies. And this is incredible. Uh, we have uh, uh, about uh, three thousand uh, uh, miles of uh, paved roads and highways in my country of a total of uh, 16,000 uh, roads, uh, miles of roads. And the, the sugar industry has built internal small roads for their transportation, about half of uh, Guatemala's paved road system. And they have uh, modified the engines of the trucks so they can do more or less the same average speed that they have uh, in the public roads. They use the internal roads from the production sites to the manufacturing, to the sugar mills. And, and But they get efficiencies because they use the truck as a tractor uh, train trailer and they, and they pull three or four times the volume that they could uh, transport via the public paved roads. I don't know if uh, if the, uh, the video is running in the presentation here, but uh, this is, uh, these are homemade uh, equipment. This is the, the, the harvester, the sugar cane harvester, and they transport it, uh, sorry. Sorry about that. They transport it uh, by tractor here uh, to the the larger trucks. These are the larger uh, trucks using the 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 these um, on paved roads internal system. To move the product uh, to 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 the mills, to the factories. This is a handmade uh, bridge that they they made, they built 
for the rainy season for the river to come below this 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 uh, manual made uh, bridge here is the the little train going into the factory so it's incredible how they managed to 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 be 300 400 percent more efficient uh, transporting the, the the raw material uh, against using the public roads um, that and <clears throat> that that are the same speeds but they are uh, hauling three or four more times of uh, cargo uh, with this with this uh, mode of transportation. So uh, I think uh, we are on time, uh, uh, and I, I, I thank you for the attention. And I'm open to questions and uh, um, uh, to contact by mail or either by LinkedIn. Uh, I'm open and honored to 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 be of help regarding uh, opportunities and ideas. Uh, uh, for the resilience and, and efficiency of the supply chain side of the business. Uh, okay, thank you so much for your presentation, Mr. Cordova. So uh, for people here uh, in the webinar, feel free to ask questions in the chat if you have them, or you can ask them directly uh, by unmuting yourself. And I personally just gonna start with one question right here. Um, so, you know, we have this because you, you briefly mentioned about, uh, you know, sustainability in your presentation. And we have, you know, the in increasing like attention and importance that is, you know, being focused into sustainability. And, you know, personally, I, I'm, I'm, I'm taking a course related to uh, pollution prevention. And we've been talking a lot about this. And what I want to ask is, you know, are there any specific examples of, you know, eco-friendly practices associated with uh, intermodal freight that you had you know, experience with, uh, that you had any contact with? Um, specifically, no, but uh, I could refer to, to this example I, 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 I gave you uh, regarding uh, how, how they use the, the promotion of the use of um rail cargo instead of truck uh, moving the those, that same cargo by truck to get out of the ports uh, is impacting positively uh, the 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 emissions side of uh, of the of the freight um i'm not talking about replacing uh, truck cargo because uh, Moving cargo by truck is is uh, is very important, but uh, uh, what in the industries and the companies and, and we 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 should do is to search for um, the the most uh, environmentally sustainable mix uh, uh, design of, uh, of of the use of different modes of transport to. To be the the more sustainable uh, possible. Okay, thank you. Uh, and just one more thing, uh, when you were mentioning, you know, about the, um, you know, in, intermodal freight industry in Guatemala and the the technologies that they have there, uh, is that a case where you would have, you know, um, uh, you know, it's I would say like first world countries using their technology to help uh you know like Latin America or Central America countries or is that something for example that Guatemala is doing by themselves? Uh, Guatemala regarding the sugar industry is exporting a lot of these uh, technologies uh, to, to the other producing countries in the region. Um, <clears throat> but um Flipping a little bit your 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 comment and your, your question, I will tell you that um, first world uh, developed countries can learn a lot uh, from the um, 
innovation that um, third world undeveloped countries are are from are using in in their in their countries uh, to 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 be competitive in the in the global uh, exporting uh, agri agri business industry uh, i think uh, the, the the developing uh, countries the developed and developing countries can learn a lot uh, because if you if you are very comfortable uh, doing the things you do in a efficient way and you don't have those deficiencies that we have in third world countries you are not thinking about how you can be even more 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 efficient so so uh, we 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 have access to 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 first world technology and uh, uh, for sure uh, the companies that are buying our products are injecting uh, uh, innovation and technology to to their suppliers in third world countries but in generally speaking in the industry i think uh, it, uh, they can learn both ways oh yeah for sure uh, that makes mm -hmm. sense thank you uh, is there any other question from people here, the participants? I I, ha I have I'm seen sure. that in your webinars, people are afraid of asking questions, but uh, I think it's a it's a general uh, phenomenon of uh, of the webinars. But um, for sure, uh, they they can ask me uh, via email or or uh, via LinkedIn. They can contact me and ask, and uh, I'm honored to answer and to uh, support uh, oh yeah yeah but, sure but uh, i see i see the very very few people ask questions <laughs> yeah i actually we were talking about this just last week how you know things are in general but i guess that's how, how it is so again thank you so much mr cordova i'm gonna pass to jasmine so uh, she can uh, wrap up the webinar so jasmine please Yes. Thank you, Atili. On behalf of FMRI and ITE, we'd like to thank Mr. Cordova for presenting to us and for all of you for attending today's webinar. This will be posted on YouTube in about a week, so if you want to rewatch this. Um, our next webinar should be later on in November for WTS, but for ITE, we have one December 5th, which I'll send out information through email soon. Thank you all for coming and have a great Wednesday. Thank you very much for everyone. Uh, it was an honor. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.